Chapter 3 is the Real Estate Commission Rules. License Law, it's going to be your foundation of what we can do and what we can't do, how many licenses you can have, powers. It's going to be describing the functions of the Department of Real Estate, the De Department of Business. It's going to be distinguishing between active and inactive. We talked a little bit about this already yesterday, but I didn't have a slide on it. I just wanted to go ahead and cover it. And you're going to see a lot of overlap from one to the next, right? I'm always talking ahead of my slides. You're going to see sometimes I'm five or six slides ahead because the material's in my head. So I'm just going to continue to slide. And if you see that, tell me to advance the slides because I do tend to not do things like I should when it comes to following the slides. I don't want you really reading them. And I don't want to be reading them either if it isn't boring, right? So the biggest thing I want to tell you on this one is multiple licenses. Multiple licenses is going to be your start item. That's going to be the, uh, the question that we're going to make sure we understand. And there's going to be group licenses too, um, and we'll, we'll distinguish the difference between the two. So all this administrative stuff, not that it's not important, but once you learn it in the class and you pass the test, you're never going to use it in day-to-day -day real estate practice. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. We're going to spend more time on other things, right? But I'll just read through the slide on what the Department of Business and Professional Regulation does, because there's one issuing the licenses, right? So this is under the executive branch, right? It's, it's administrators of the DVPR secretary, it's, and that person is appointed by the governor. So they're appointed in terms, just like a governor would be elected, right? So when you have a new governor, you're gonna get a new secretary of the DVPR, okay? Um, and then they, they, they handle licenses and regulation of business and professionals. They grant legal powers uh, by legislature investigating complaints. So anytime you submit a complaint online, to the Real Estate Commission or the Department of Business, they're gonna investigate that. They're gonna issue these subpoenas to make sure that you're covered or that you have to come in and show up, right? And then uh, they're gonna issue any cease and desist orders when things are going bad. If somebody's running a Ponzi scheme, for example, right? They're gonna shut you down, not let you do business. We know people have done that. Um, people that are close to our heart, right? And so then we're gonna issue citations as well um, if there's enough to put a fine out, so you didn't do your signage, you didn't do things like that. So they're gonna issue these small citations. They're not gonna put you in jail, they don't have judicial powers, right? But they do have administrative powers, so it's more like executory branch, executive branch, right? So then you have the divisions, you have these different divisions, right? So you have you have service operations and professions. We don't deal with this. We deal with Florida condos, timeshares, and mobile homes, right? Remember mobile homes are not real estate, they're a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have division of real estate, which is us and that office is where, remember where Crack meets, they meet in Orlando, right? This is where the employees of DVPR are. They also have uh, an office in Tallahassee for that stuff, but the Real Estate Commission is in Orlando. And we administer our license in there. So, ministerial means bookkeeping, right? That's our record keeping. It's not, not our church duties. So here's your real estate commission information. So regulatory, it's a regulatory body charged by the legislature. We, we're here to protect the public. The whole purpose of the real estate commission is to protect the public, right? And it's to education licensee, educate licensees. So it's protecting and educating. That's what we're doing as real estate instructors too. We're trying to educate you so you don't make a mistake, right? You don't do the wrong things. Everybody makes mistakes. If you make a mistake, let's fix it. Let's teach you how to do it right, right? Just regulating us, right? Real estate brokers, real estate broker associates, sales associates, brokerage firms, real estate schools, and instructors, right? It's going to regulate everything. I have reporting requirements. After your class is done, I have to report within a certain time period. If I don't, I get in trouble, I crack, right? It's all about protecting people because remember, you only have two years to do your license, right? If I'm not reporting you timely, maybe you missed the opportunity. It's now my fault that you didn't get a license. I'm not going to let that happen. Because if I let that happen, you're going to call Frank. Frank's going to investigate me and they're going to shut me down. So it's not worth it. Um, we always want to make sure we're protecting everybody. That's the key to real estate agents, right? So now, what is the Real Estate Commission? And this is this is a group of seven individuals. All right, there's seven individuals. There's five licensees, right? There's five, and I'll do this like this. There's five licensees, right? professional license number, and there's two consumers, so I like to do it on two hands, right? Now, 
Here's the catch. Four of those licensees have to have held the broker's license. They don't have to be active, but they had to have held, they don't have to be active at the time that they're in the commission, but they had to have held an active broker license for the five years preceding appointment. So the four licensees, right? Broker licenses, right? One broker associate or sales associate, right? Active last two years. So that's like a newbie that gets in the business. So a commission is four brokers, one broker associate or licensee, sales licensee. Mm -hmm. right, so it's five total, five professionals, four of those are brokers. Remember this. One is a, one is a sales licensee or a licensed broker or associate. It doesn't matter. They could be a broker as well, but normally they pick somebody a little newer that has just a sales license or, or a broker associate's license, right? Two consumer members. Now, of the two consumer members, we need to have one person that's over 60 because we want to make sure everybody's got an interest in this, right? So you want an elderly person and a younger person. Two elderly people's fine, but you can't have two younger people because you need to have all generations covered, right? So that's why they do the composition the way they do. Everything's going to be done on majority vote. Got this? Seven people, five professionals, four brokers, active and active for the past five years, right? They don't have to be active at the time at when they're appointed, but they have to be active at the time that they are appointed, right? Most people are going to continue to be active because they want to continue to make money. Um, one has to be licensed as a sales associate. Or so one has to be associate. over 60. One has to be over 60. They're going to ask you a question about the composition of breath. Now the consumer hmm? one, the only one is that they have to be over 60 years of age. What's the other? Consumer has to be one over 60. That's the only that, That's the only thing. Okay. okay. Five professionals. Remember, five professionals, yeah. two laymen. That's all you need. Five professionals, two laymen, four brokers, one broker associate or sales associate. Or up to years. And then one person over 60. All right. Easy. That's what this, that's the whole purpose of this slide is to tell you the composition. And you need to know the composition. Okay. I promise, I promise you that. So here you go. Commissioners are appointed by the governor. They're confirmed by the Senate, right? No more than two consecutive terms. Just like governors, you can't have more than two consecutive terms. Now, the difference is if you're governor, you can only have two consecutive terms. If you're a commissioner, you can have two consecutive terms and then be off of term and then go back again, right? You just can't have more than two consecutive terms. You can serve three, you can serve four, but they might be two years apart, four years apart, eight years apart, whatever. Right? And they're not all appointed at the same time because you don't want to turn over everybody at the same time, right? <clears throat> so you're exempt from civil liability, you're exempt from all these these issues. Like if you were to rule one way as crack and then you got sued, you wouldn't be liable for that lawsuit because you did something under the government authority, right? So now you don't get any money either. It's a volunteer thing. You get fifty dollars a day for per DM for travel or anything like that right official expenses are reimbursed and you have monthly meetings so you're it's a big commitment you're going in but you're also helping rewrite sometimes law so it's it's a it's a fun task if you want to take it on me personally i got too much going on but there's a lot of people that want to do it right commission general powers and duties so you have the executive power again you have regulate and enforcing license law right Fostering education, adopting the seal. When we talk about adopting a seal, we talk about prima facie. Remember what we said prima facie was. Prima yeah. facie is take things at face value. If it's a dime, it's worth 10 cents. If you have a real estate license, then that says it's a what? It's valid. It's valid, right? Yeah. It's valid, you can use it, right? And then they establish the fee. So they're the guys that say, hey, I want to I want to charge you $85 for your license renewal. That's what the commission does. They have these quasi-legislative. You now, what quasi means is what? Eh, a little bit. It's kind of that way. Quasi means, I call it come see, come saw. That's what I say. It's French for, so yeah, so. maybe so-so, right? So it's kind of like it's legislative, right? Because we're, we're adopting rules, right? We're regulating practices. We're not actually making the laws, but we're adopting them, right? So it's quasi-legislative. Um, and we're revising rules and bylaws, but again, we're still getting approval for the actual law that's going through a vote. 
Same thing with quasi-judicial. We're not putting people in jail, but we are granting and denying your application, right? We're telling you, hey, you're not qualified for this application. You came up on the summary of applicants. Remember what the summary of applicants was? When you when you have like a crime and you and you show up on this list, you gotta go yeah. 90 days, you get your license approved, yeah. right? or denied, right? They can suspend and revoke your license and give you fines. They can make determinations of violations. Uh, they do this fact-finding mission, and we're going to go over that later on. Um, but remember, it's always limited to this administrative action, right? We can't put you in jail, right? If it's something like that, we're going to refer you to the Department of Law Enforcement to take care of that piece of it. We're only going to handle the administrative piece. Commission's never going to put you in jail. They might fine you, but if it's a large fine, criminal penalties, they're going to send you to law enforcement. Right, better get a lawyer. So here's the renewal periods. We talked about this yesterday, or so it's a lot of re reiteration of the same thing. So when do licenses renew? Twice a year. Uh, March, March and September. September. Right, March 31st, September 30th, every year, right? You have to renew prior to your expiration date. You have, and you're notified by the DVPR 90 days in advance. Now, most brokers are not going to tell you when, you, when you're when you expiring. I try to print a list out every year and email people and tell them, hey, my license is, your license is up for renewal. You probably need to do your continuing education. How much continuing education do you have to do in your first two years? Or your first 18 to 24 months? Two different? 45 hours the 45 hours 45 hours your first renewal cycle you have to do 45 hours right yeah. 45 hours so what's the first thing you have to do to get a broker's license you have to do your 45 hour post licensing right because yeah. if you don't do your 45 hour post licensing you can't renew your license if you can't renew your license you can't be in the business two years it's a must so you have to do that right you're going to see it again don't forget that one <laughs> um post licensing education requirement must be completed. Right here, it says that right there, right? So after the first cycle, then you have 14 hours of continuing education. Late, late, uh, late fees are charged after the expiration date of your license. If your license expires the first time, there's no late fee. You just don't have a license anymore. You're null and void, you're gone, right? Um, you have to take FRET course one again, you have to take the exam again, you have to do fingerprints and application and all that stuff over again if you don't do your 45 hours. Afterwards, you can have a late fee, right? For not renewing. Unlicensed practice of real estate following the expiration of license, what that means is if your license expires, you can't practice anymore. Can you get paid on the transaction that you did before your license expired? The answer is yes. Can you? Hmm. As long as you were active at the time you procured the sale, they can close after you lose your license. You can still get paid on it. That's up to your broker and your contract to see if you get paid on it. But nice brokers will pay you. Some brokers won't. I'm not going to name any names because I'm on recording. <laughs> but there's some we can talk about after class. <laughs> and then we have what? An exception, right? We always have exceptions to everything. And why do we have exceptions? Military. Because we're always military, military, right? So if you're in good standing, you can do this for up to two years after discharge. So they're giving you that two-year period that you can renew. What if you're deployed to Afghanistan for, you know, three years and you can't renew your license? You're in some remote place in Libya. You're, you know, somewhere you can't get to it. And that's why they're doing this, right? Not only that, the exemption also applies to a spouse if you're out of state. So they can be out of state and it applies to the spouse. If they're local, it can't apply to the spouse. What? If you're stationed at Mayport, can you renew your license Absolutely. if you're a spouse? Yeah. Yeah. You're here. So you think about it conceptually, you won't get it wrong, right? So then we have this status. And we talked about statuses yesterday. How many statuses do we have? Active, inactive. There's, there's actually four. Four. But we talked about three in a class. There's actually four of them. So the first status is active, right? You get your license. You initially get your license. You pass your test. Mm -hmm. Question is, are you active or inactive? You're inactive. 
You're inactive. Why? Because you don't have any bond to register. Because you don't have a broker. Right. right. You don't have a broker registered. You right. So, are you voluntary or involuntarily inactive? Involuntarily. Mm -hmm. Involuntary because you don't. You don't. You're voluntarily right. inactive because you have the choice to go activate right. your license. Mm -hmm. You can join stuff, right? Active licenses means what? I'm active with a broker. I can now right. practice real estate, right? Voluntarily inactive means I'm vol I'm inactive. Maybe I got a job working in securities and I'm trading stocks for Merrill Lynch, right? And they don't want me to have my active real estate license. Yeah. Well, I want to keep my real estate license because if I ever leave that job, I want to go back. So I'm going to be voluntarily inactive. I'm going to continue to do my education. I'm going to continue to do my renewals. And then when I get out of that job or retire, I'm going to go back and get my license back, right? So you request this inactive status, right? You have to, and here it says right here, you have to complete your education, right? You have to complete your renewals. Involuntarily inactive is two reasons. Number one, failing to renew your license, right? The other reason is if somebody revokes it or somebody is investigating you and they put you in a voluntary inactive. You can't just go back and activate your license. Somebody has to release it, right? It doesn't say that on the slide, but there's two ways there. After two years, you're involuntarily inactive status. Goes, goes away, right? Now, first time you get involuntarily active, you didn't finish your 14 hour continuing education, okay? What do you have to do to reinstate your license? You do a 28 hour reactivation course within that second two years, and that's how you get it back. Because right? right? remember, you're already two years out whenever you get to this test. So now you've got two more years, and then you're done, right? Back in the day, they would just know avoid your license share. What happens if you don't continue your, you do your 45 hour continuing education? And are you any of these statuses? No, you're not a void. You're garbage, you're gone, you gotta start over, you gotta take your class again, you gotta take your test again. I don't wanna take my test again. I'll pass it, but I don't wanna take it, right? Questions on that? No? I see your wheels turning, you got questions on that? No, I'm used processing it the uh, involuntary I involuntary uh, involuntarily means you can't reactivate your license that means the agent failed themselves to activate correct it. or somebody's investigating you have a suspension or they've shut you down because of something that something you've done. that you've done wrong a season right system. so that would be right it's involuntarily okay. right. null and void would be sorry it's done right it's a thing so null and void is basically yeah, that's the yeah, sorry, uh, that's the finale you're you either got revoked or you or you or you have to start over one or the other. If you got revoked, you can forget starting over. <laughs> Do they stop anyone from starting over? No, I actually had an agent call me today. She's like, I don't see my license anymore. I was like, Yeah, you didn't do your forty-five hour post licensing. And she's like, Oh, I was like, you Gotta take the course again. So she's gonna take the course again, which I'm happy because now I get paid. <laughs> um, involuntarily inactive license. Reactivates education. So this is what I just talked about, right? So you're you're involuntary for less than 12 months. You're actually involuntary for that first cycle period, right? You have to complete this 14-hour continuing education. But if you're more than that 12 months, you have to do 28 hours, right? So my cousin is involuntarily inactive right now. He didn't do his renewal. He's got to do a 28-hour re reactivation course so that he can get his license back, or he has to start all over again. So after this is done, this is new. Back in the day when we got our license, they didn't have this. You couldn't get right. it. It's only been around for like eight years, maybe, that you're allowed to do this. And before that, you just lost your license and you started over. You're not going to get tested on this piece. You might get tested on 14 hours. You're not going to get tested on the rate. Oh, okay. Right. 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 So that, that's not important. The 45 hours is really important. We're going to say the 45 hours is the most important. Okay. 45 hours is the most important. Okay. How do you reinstate your null and void license? See, there's a fourth status. They don't tell you that on that page, but there's four status. Failure to comply because of an economic hardship, it better be a pretty good hardship. You're not gonna get it, right? You have to apply within that six months after your license became null and void. And then Freck has no uh, legislative, we talked about this yesterday, they have no legislative authority to, to extend that past that one six month period. The girl that had her license null and void, 
she and her spouse both had surgeries. They both had all kinds of issues. Well, we're not gonna let them do that. They're gonna have to retake the course. It has to be some type. Yeah, physical hardship, she could try. It's not likely. And the fact that it, it expired in March and now it's September, it's definitely not gonna happen, right? If she was gonna do it, she'd have to do it in the next week and a half, two weeks. And to get it pushed through to the state by then, it's not gonna happen. So it's, it's not likely, right? So I told her, I'll just go get your license again if you wanna do it. So it's easier to get the license than to try to uh, go, yeah. through, go through that process. Pay the fees and move on. Got it. Yeah. If you pass the test the first time, there should be no reason you can't pass it again. Right. All right, so null, null and void means no longer exist, right? License been inactive, right? Been voluntarily inactive for two years more than two years, revoked following disciplinary proceedings, failure to complete post-licensing education. This is the biggest one before initial licensure expiration. Your initial licensure expiration is important. You have to do that 45 hours. Voluntarily relinquish or cancel your license. You can do that yourself. Nobody does that. They just let their education expire. Right. You could, and if you're gonna be disciplined, sometimes people will give up their license, right? Because if you get disciplined, and you give up your license, sometimes they'll forgive you for any fines you might get. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fines are substantial, forty, fifty thousand dollars then you, you can't pay it, so you might as well just render it later. render your license. You'll never get your license again if you do that. But mm -hmm. but trust me, you're not gonna be in this business, you're gonna go into something else. <clears throat> All right. So when they have an involuntary license and you're no one voting license, you know are ceasing to be enforced, right? You can't conduct business if you don't have an active license, right? So here's your license, here's your reasons. Broker changes business address, your license is now inactive. It's involuntarily inactive until I register a new address and put you back on the roster to make sure you're active again, right? Real estate school changes business address. Here's the good news about that. I can be licensed at a couple different schools at the same time. So you get licensed at the new school first, then you change the address. Then you then you move that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's ways to keep you in light in licensure status active, right? If you change employers, you're inactive, right? This one, this one changes now. They used to, remember you're thinking about old school. We used to have paper documents. Now, literally, you leave me and you come to the next guy in a click of a button. So you never really have a cease to be enforced with that anymore. But if you're tested on it, that's going to be the answer, right? And then instructor changes employers. If I change employers, I cease to be enforced. Same thing, clicking, clicking. I change my license from Premier to us with a click of a button. So literally I was inactive for what, a nanosecond? It was like really small, right? And you have to notify the UPR 10 days. Anytime you change your address, you have to notify because they need to know where to mail you documents if you're gonna be on it. Or you're gonna be checked out for anything. They need to get you into a prep meeting they need to be able to contact you. So change your address within 10 days. It's the same thing for your driver's license, right? You get your driver's license, you're supposed to change it within 10 days, right? Current mailing address, residential address is, is what we use to receive mail. I use my mom's address because it never changes, right? Never, ever, ever changes. My mom's never moving. So it saves me the hassle of having to change my license to address all the time. I just use my mom's address. Don't use your office address because if your office moves then now you have it, it's too much trouble right? so it goes inactive for how long uh, while the moving until taking place until you have a new office but can you just update it and there would be seconds in between yeah correct i mean that would but be but but you're putting the burden on the broker at that point because all your agents licenses right become inactive the burdens on the broker right so now now you're relying on your broker and what if your broker goes out of town for two weeks? Now you're, you're out of business, right? So you don't want to do that, right? This is where the DVPR sends you your official communication. And if you don't do it timely, you can get about an administrative fine, right? And we're gonna talk about levels of fines. So this is an administrative fine. If it's $500, it's, it's a, they call it a citation, but it's an administrative fine. Right? Um, so, Non-residents, this is what we have to do, right? 60 days of change of residency. So if you leave the state, you have to let the state know that you've moved, 
right, out of state. Now you need 10 days for your address change, but you're not practicing if you moved out of state. Think about it, I mean, you're really not, mm -hmm. right? Um, you could, but you're not likely to be practicing, right? Uh, you still have to complete your post licensing and your education. Um, and if you don't do your timely notification, it's $300, it's a little less than here, right? If you're a resident, you're a little bit more active, so they're gonna assume that you need to do things quicker. The licensee is inactive at the time of performing services. We just talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. If you're inactive at the time you perform services, you cannot get paid. But if you're active, you can. If you're active, you can refer business, you can do whatever. You don't have to be in the state, you can do whatever, right? As long as you're active and doing things legally, you can get paid, right? Only if you're licensed. If you're unlicensed, you can only pay them what? Salary, right? We talked salary, about salaries. Salary. No bonuses, salary hourly, that's it, right? If they're unlicensed. If they're getting paid transactionally, get bonuses, get commissions, have to have a license, right? Now, what if my agent buys a, or sells a house in February of 2020, okay? It's a new build, right? And they move to Michigan in August of 2020 and the deal closes so they moved they've been activated their license they moved and the deal closes in June of 2021 because it's a 14 months to build the house or 16 months to build the house whatever can they be paid were they active when they initiated the transaction well yeah, they were active. So they're, they're okay. So they're okay, right? They right. get paid. Right. Whether they lost their license or not, they can get paid. Whether they renewed, whether they didn't renew, it doesn't matter. They can get paid as long as they procured it while they're active. What if they procured the sale with an inactive license and came to Florida? Can you get paid? No. No. No, because unlicensed. If you're getting paid unlicensedly, then it's five, it's a felony. It's five years in jail, five thousand dollar fine. Practicing without a license is considered a felony. Right? So, and you'll see that on the exam as well um, about what a felony is and what the fines are. Or you'll see misdemeanors, which we're going to cover as well. So. There's only three levels of fines in the real estate business when it comes to criminal stuff, so you should be okay. So multiple licenses, so we're gonna have two different types of multiple license situation. You have multiple licenses, you have group licenses. Multiple licenses issued to a broker. Brokers can hold multiple real estate licenses. You can't hold them as sales associates, but I can hold a multiple broker's license. I own, a, I own a brokerage in Kentucky. I own a Florida brokerage. I have a referral company. I can manage and be the broker for all these companies. If you want to open up a third real estate company, I can be your broker, right? I can have multiple licenses with different brokerages because I'm not selling for each brokerage, I'm managing that brokerage, mm -hmm. right? So I qualify for one, it's called multiple license, right? I qualify for two or three, it doesn't matter, right? Same thing with the real estate school, right? I'm a managing broker for the real estate school, I'm a managing broker for my real estate company managing broker for my real estate referral company, managing broker for my company in Kentucky. I've got four brokerages, four brokerage licenses, right? But I only have one number, but I have four brokerage licenses, right? Each, each entity has their own license, right? Then you have, for each business that a person is a broker, a separate broker license must be attained, right? So I have a, we have a CQ license in the real estate world. It's, it's a CQ license versus a BK license. I have a BK license. I have a ZH license too, which is my instructor's license. It's all the same, they're, they're, but they're different numbers and they're registered to different entities, right? CQ is registered to my real estate brokerage, for example. Then we have, so here we go. Sales associates and broker associates are registered under how many brokers? One, you can only have one broker, right? You only have one broker or one under a developer you're working for, right? Now the difference is you're going to go to group licenses, and group licenses are issued to sales associates who register under an owner developer. Owner developer like DR Horton, KB Homes, they have multiple sites that you can work at, right? You can work at 
for for Richmond America, you work at Scarlet Oaks, you can work at, at Pine Ridge, you can work at um, Murata, you can work at who knows where, Amelia, Chase, or whatever they have, right? So because they can transfer you to all these other sites, you're working under a group license for that owner developer, right? They have a list of company names as well that have, they basically you broker or the owner developer provides all the, the, the information to DBPR and they can move you around. That's how, a, that's how a floater is assigned to one sales office, maybe two days a week, right? So sales associate has one license, the owner developer has one, like there's only one employer. So it's one license, one employer, that doesn't change. The difference is, is I can work at any of the sites, right? I can work at Scarlet Oaks. I can work at Verona Creek, I can work at Murata. I can work in Amelia Island. I can work in Orlando. It doesn't matter where I'm working as long as I'm working for that developer. Same with DR Horton. I can work at Aberdeen or I can work at Bay Point. It doesn't matter. I have one license, I have one employer. They have a group license. So group license? When I think of owner developer. I think of builders. Think of big builders. builders. Okay. Think of big builders. It's easiest to remember. That's the best them. way. Okay. Right. Multiple licenses is a broker with multiple licenses, multiple companies. Group licenses a builder developer with multiple sites. Under the same ownership. Under the same ownership. Okay. Alright. And that is chapter three. Yes. So we have any questions on chapter three?